What Do We Want History to Do to Use Us? by Zadie Smith. I ask myself, what I want history to do to me. Its meaning is unsettling and unsettled, existing in a gray zone between statement, confession, and desire. The sentence pulls in two directions, giving no slack, tense, like rope. What might I want history to do to me? I might want history to reduce my historical antagonist and increase me. I might ask it urgently to remind me why I am moving forward away from history. Or speak to me always of our intimate relation, of the ties that bind an indelible link, my history and me. I could want history to tell me that my future is tied to my past, whether I want it to be or not. Or ask it to promise me that my future will revenge upon my past. Or warn me that the past is not erased by this revenge. Or suggest to me that brutal oppression implicates the oppressors who are in turn brutalized by their own acts of oppression. I might want history to convince me that although some identities are chosen, many others are forced, or that no identities are chosen, or that all identities are chosen, that I feed history, that history feeds me, that we starve each other. All these things, none of them, all of them in an unholy mix of the true and the false. This is originally from a magazine article in Ebony Magazine in 1965, entitled The White Man's Guilt by James Baldwin. History, as nearly no one seems to know, is not merely something to read, and it does not refer merely or even principally to the past. On the contrary, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways. And history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. It's great to be here. <laughs> Somebody, uh, several people have asked when was the last time I was here, and maybe you weren't here the last time I was here, which was. Uh, Almost four years ago, uh, in June, it was the uh, Friday or Saturday, it's right after Wendy Winters had been murdered. <laughs> and um, we had a vigil here in the church for Wendy. And that was the last time I was here. I've, I've spoken many times on Zoom, workshops, lectures, all kinds of things. But this is actually my first live appearance uh, since um, since that, that time. And... Uh, you may detect a, a theme in the, the readings, thank you Thornell and th thank you Angelique, uh, of history. You know, if, if, when I look back on my final years with you uh, as we partnered in ministry, uh, I remember at least becoming more and more historical and autobiographical in my sermons. And I don't know if that was just the length of time I'd served with you or if it was my uh, aging uh, as I began to think more and more about how did I come to be who I was, where I am, and why was I a Unitarian Universalist, and how did this congregation come to be who it is, and all these kinds of historical questions, which in part has led me to today. 
Um, I want, some of you may be wondering, so why am I here today? How did this all happen besides being Minister Emeritus? Um, I want to thank Olga Pabon, who did the, um, the story, uh, and Angelique Berry and Stan Keeve and Thornell Jones, who were part of a team that purchased me, uh, purchased <laughs> my sermon at the church auction last fall. And uh, we've had several Zoom conversations. And when I saw the people who had bought my sermon, I kind of thought, oh, I think I have an idea where this may go. Uh, and so we kind of came to an agreement after many conversations uh, that there were several resources that I was going to use. Um, whoops. Let's see if this one more. Okay. Uh, they asked me to base my talk, my sermon this morning, on two resources. One is widening the circle of concern which is the Unitarian Universalist Association's Commission on Institutional Changes report as they look back over approximately the last 35, 40 years of uh, Unitarian Universalism's attempt to become more inclusive and diverse, uh, multicultural towards a beloved community. And a second source that the team, the group, asked me to refer to is the Eighth Principle, uh, many of you know that the UUA uh, has seven principles. Uh, some people think it's our orthodoxy. Uh, it's not. Uh, but we have seven principles. And there is an eighth principle being under consideration that will actually be voted on in 2023, starting at the General Assembly. And then two years, they'll take a vote. And I'll get into a little bit more of that later on. And then I've added a third resource, because I think it's very important if you don't know about it. Mistakes and Miracles, which is a book about congregations, five congregations in the UUA that have been on the journey toward beloved community. This congregation comprises 20% of the book uh, and its history. And if you haven't read it, I would urge you to read at least that third chapter, which is about this book, uh, about this congregation, as well as some of the concluding uh, pages, which I didn't know were there until I made it a deliberate effort to, to find uh, more about the church and some of the reactions that the authors, the co-authors had to what they discovered here. So in large part, my comments this morning are based on these three resources. That's a little bit of the history behind what's going on this morning. And so speaking of history, I want to hold up in particular this last sentence from James Baldwin, uh, where he says, it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. In other words, we have been shaped by our histories, be they national histories, ethnic histories, family histories. They all go into composing who we are and as Zadie Smith said, as much as we wish to deny that history, it's pretty tough not to. Uh, it, it is our history. It is who we are. So I'd like to begin by focusing in particular on our frames of reference. And when I say our frames of reference, I'm specifically referring to our frame of reference as the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Annapolis. After 34 years of partnering in ministry with you, by the time I left, I felt as though we shared quite a few frames of reference. Uh, after that many years, we were like a family, and we shared a lot of frames of reference. In fact, many people came to this congregation knowing what those frames of references were. That's, that's why they were here. And we continued to develop in breadth and depth those frames of references. And then something happened along the way. Near the end of my time with you, and particularly on November 8th, uh, 2016, our reference, frames of reference came crashing down. A frame of reference not only we shared, but a frame of reference that the country shared, or at least many in the country shared. Uh, we elected a president of the United States who was a white supremacist, a homophobic, misogynist, sexual predator. 
Um, and I think the longer we have distanced ourselves from that presidency, the more we realize all of that is very, very true. I remember near the end of my ministry with you, I did one of these question box sermons, and somebody asked me whether what, what did I think the psychological state of that president was? And I said, as far as I'm concerned, he was severely, severely psychotic. Uh, and I th feel as though everything that's happened since has proved me true. Uh, it's a very, very scary time. That was a very scary time for many of us. We were disillusioned. We never expected it. He didn't expect it, right? He never thought he was going to be elected president. Nobody around him thought so. And he was. And I feel as though the, the nation has been suffering ever since. Now, what you may not have noticed was about five months after the election of President Trump, the president of the UUA resigned. Five months after one president comes, the president of the UUA leaves. And he leaves under the cloud of accusations of paternalism and white supremacy. This man is Hispanic. Under the cloud of paternalism and white supremacy and hiring practices at the UUA. And the immediate reaction by my colleagues, and quite frankly, me, and many of my friends was, it can't be. That's impossible. I mean, look who Peter Morales is. He's been to this church several times. People love Peter. How could he be a paternalistic? How could he be a white supremacist? How could he be a racist? That's impossible. And besides that, we're Unitarian Universalists. We're not white supremacists. We're not racists. There's not a paternalistic bone in our bodies, our collective bodies, right? Hmm. Um, and then these same people said, besides where we should be focusing our attention is on this person, the country's just elected president. We need to resist those policies. Let's not get caught up in what's going on in the UUA, mainly because it's simply cannot be true. It was at the same time that I was just beginning to do some research. As many of you know, um, I have been for the last 25 years the UUA's ambassador to the Unitarian Universalist congregations in the Philippines. And uh, every time I went to the Philippines, which was about every three years, I would read an additional one or two novels written by Filipino authors, or I would read history books, or I would read interpretations of histories, of Filipino life. Uh, and I was getting deeply and more deeply emerged until I discovered, and then I became more deeply emerged, uh, immersed in uh, the history, when I discovered that there was a, a disproportionately large number of Unitarians and Universalists who were involved in the shaping and implementation of imperial colonial policy in the Philippines and Hawaii beginning in 1898. Um, and some of that disproportionately large thinking all took place because of the Unitarians and Universalist participation in the American eugenics movement. Um, so when I begin hearing people say, White supremacy and racism and paternalism aren't part of Unitarian Universalism. My first reaction was, oh no. Uh, going back to at least the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, uh, our theology was being shaped at that time by something we were, called, we were calling individualism, which turned out to be a toxic individualism, which became exceptionalism, which made it very easy to slide into paternalism, white supremacy, and racism. We're doing this for your own good, kind of an attitude. And what it was most alarming to me, and I did this, an act of love would be too extreme, but an act of concern was the way not only Americans, but in particular, Unitarian Universalists always had to write a narrative where we were on the right side of history. Uh, we were always the good guys, uh, doing what was best for everybody. And it kind of reminded me of this cartoon that appeared in the New Yorker. I don't know if you can read it. 
The man is saying, that's strange. I remember it differently in a way that aligns with my world of view and casts me in a positive light. <laughs> that kind of twisting of sometimes the reality and the facts I saw taking place not only in American history, but in Unitarian Universalist history. You know, I'm a firm believer that in order to be able to move on, we need to be able to tell our history the way it actually was uh, for all of its uh, goodness as well as all of its challenges. And so that, that spinning that would often take place. And I, I mean, I can remember sitting back in the library telling people who were new to the congregation all about these glorious individuals within Unitarian Universalism. You know, you don't want to sit there and say, yeah, we were an imperialist colonizing faith and we're still trying to develop a way to get out of all of that. But that's a part of who we were. That's a part of who this country is. Uh, and that, and, and, and so one of the things that I urge you to read is that commission's report, because what it does is it highlights a lot of what I'm talking about right now and gives direction into how to move away from that. And so it becomes a very important document for any congregation, any individual who says they are committed to moving into the beloved community and away from some of these characteristics that are so American, uh, so Western, uh, and so Unitarian Universalist. It is to our history that we owe our frames of reference and our identities. And our identities. So what have I been doing the last four and a half years, some people have asked me. Well, one of the things I've been doing is this research uh, that I keep thinking is going to be a book at some point in time. And I take great, uh, great uh, umbrance when I read that all these people have written books and it's taken them 10 to 15 years because that's probably about how long it's going to take me to finally come out with this book, uh, which is not going to be a barn burner or a bestseller, but I think that for the right people, it's going to be interesting. Uh, why were all these Unitarian and Universalists involved in colonization and imperialism? And how does that affect us today? Um, so that's one of the things I've been doing. But two of the other things that I've been doing that bring us close, at least has brought me closer to understanding how our history has shaped our identities was about a year after ending my time with you, I was asked um, by the president of the UUA, and I've always said I never turn down the president of the UUA, no matter what they ask me to do. Don't tell them that, but I've never done that. Uh, I was asked to be the part-time interim director of the international office for the UUA. And there are several programs, including our uh, office at the United Nations and our, off our uh, work with uh, Indian, the continent, the um, country of India, uh, Indian women. Uh, and labor forces there, uh, as well as several other programs. But it puts us in contact with a very inclusive and a very diverse community of religious liberals and Unitarians and Universalists around the world. And one of the things the international office has always done is it's maintained this identity of being open, of being inclusive, of working toward a diverse community. And it felt really good to be part of a team that was doing that, how, albeit part-time, it, it felt really, really good to see that kind of a commitment and work with professionals who saw that as the bedrock of their identity. Part of my time into that, I began to realize, you know, as much as inclusiveness and um, diversity are really worthy goals, there was a part of that that didn't feel okay. Uh, because oftentimes my experience in congregations uh, as well as with the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, has been that we say, yes, come on in. We are inclusive. We are diverse. And here are the characteristics we wish you to measure up to. <laughs> this is what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist. Uh, and you're welcome here, and we wish to be diverse, parenthetically, as long as this is what you're willing to be and do. 
And so quickly, another joke out of the New Yorker. This man is being interviewed, and he says, actually, Lou, I think it was more than just my being in the right place at the right time. I think it was my being the right race, the right religion, the right sex, the right socioeconomic group, having the right accent, the right clothes, going to the right schools. And sometimes in my faith community, I have felt like you're more likely to be included if you've done all the right things if you've gone to the right schools, if you've read the right books, as long as you watch the right news, the right radio station. Anybody here listen to NPR? <laughs> I mean, it just the list just kind of goes on and on, right? There's, there is a right way to be a Unitarian Universalist. That is very different from being an affirming congregation. And the difference is when we are an affirming congregation, we affirm people as they are, not as we think they should be. And so that inclusiveness and that diversity is built on being affirming. And affirming can lead to being inclusive and diverse. But there's a difference that I hope you can see. And I believe that affirming takes you to radical hospitality. It's just not, you know, offering somebody a cup of coffee. I mean, you know, and speaking of winters, you know, Wendy had this knack, you know, for all the things that drove me nuts about She had this ability. She believed in radical hospitality. I think all the times that Wendy was out at the front doors, when you could go to the front door, and, and welcome people, and she would, no matter, it would, she this ability to find people who, for lack of better words, might have felt marginalized or even threatened by a community like this and welcome them in such a way that they felt affirmed. Radical hospitality, it can be challenging because it really requires us to step outside of our comfort zone and be with people, welcome people, partner with people, who may not live up to our set of expectations of who they, of who we think they're supposed to be. And so the next thing I did in my list of things since I haven't been around is that I was asked to be the executive director for 12 months, which turned out to be 18 months, of the Unitarian Universalist Partner Church Council. Some of you may know that the Partner Church Council was the facilitating organization for North American, Canada and the United States, North American Unitarian Universalist congregations who chose to partner with international liberal religious organizations, congregations. So our primary audience there was facilitating these partnerships between North American congregations with Hungary, Romania, Philippines, and um, Kazi Hills, India. Way up in the northeastern corner of India, we have Unitarian congregations that are nearly 200 years old. Um, and, you know, they got these big neon flaming chalices over their church that blink <laughs> on and off. And, you know, if you go online, you can see these pictures. You know, they have no problem advertising who they are. Uh, they love the flaming chalice. And radical hospitality became one of our biggest challenges. So when I was brought into um, this work, which I said was, uh, I was told it was going to be 12 months and it ended up being 18 months, I had uh, like three ob stated objectives and then a fourth one got tacked on. One was to continue the facilitation of the programs that people expected, the stakeholders, the dues-paying members. Number two, and this will sound contradictory, was to close down the organization. <laughs> Legally, programmatically, to dissolve the organization. Uh, this was no secret. The board was in favor of it. The stakeholders were coming along. They were beginning to accept it. Uh, the third thing that I was going to be part of was an international group of Unitarians and Universalists who were beginning to draw up very broad guidelines for what a new international Unitarian Universalist organization might look like. 
what it might look like. And then the part that I didn't know I was going to get involved with was a group of U.S. ministers who were going to write an addendum to the commission's report, but looking at it through an international lens. So what would all those things the commission recommended look like in terms of the international field? And things were going along pretty well until during several Zoom meetings, um, we came to this point where the international group had decided that we were no longer going to write a mission statement and give goals to those composing the new organization. There were going to be six people and they were going to choose an additional six. And that's where the proverbial rubber hit the road because what it meant was decentering the North American white people and handing power over to an international panel of multi-generational brown people. And um, it didn't go well. In fact, during two Zoom meetings, we had people try to take over the meetings and redirect the group in a way that they thought we should be going. Uh, and the first time that happened, we were able, I'm not quite sure how it happened, to more or less silence the person and continue on with our agenda. And the second time <laughs> was a uh, person who had been the executive director for a national nonprofit, very well known nonprofit. Uh, that I won't name, uh, wrote me the next day and they had listened to the audio recording of the entire meeting and she wrote me three pages of mission statement and goals for the new organization. Now, see, you've got to understand that all of the partners that we're dealing with used to be colonies. The Philippines and the Kazi Hills. In Romania... And Hungary, while they were not colonies, that spent a good portion of their national nationalhood living in autocracy under communist rule with the same oppressions that often come with colonization. And so we're saying, we want to partner with you. Here's what you're going to do, and this is what you're going to look like. <laughs> right? Kind of like raising children in a way. You know, you're trying to protect them, but at the same time, you want to give them their wings and their freedom. Right? What parent hasn't gone through that? Uh, and the challenge, the difficulty in being able to step away and letting them fly on their own with the wings that they, you have given them. That requires radical hospitality. It was almost as though these people who tried to take over the meeting where they rewrote everything they heard in terms of a mission statement and goals, it's almost like they had a secret kind of knowledge, a force that they thought was so important that nobody else could possibly understand. And so my third cartoon, use your white privilege, Luke. <laughs> That's that special force. Can you see that? I know I wander around and I get in the way sometimes. And that's always seems to be the ace that white people especially carry around. Use your white privilege, Luke. So what can be our guiding force in the work that we do toward beloved community? What is our aspiration? What is the shared aspiration of this congregation, the shared aspiration of the UUA? And this brings up the second source that my team of buyers wanted me to reference, which is our eighth principle. At least for this congregation, you've already said, yes, this should be our eighth principle. And I think it would be amazing that the UUA wouldn't approve this. I expect it to be approved. There may be a little bit of tinkering, as there often is, with the language. I mean, you use love to wordsmith. Um, but basically what it says is journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. This uh, graphic comes from the 
Unitarian Church of Evanston, Illinois, and I really like it because you've got the seven principles up on top, and then you've got the eighth principle basically holding up the other seven principles. That those seven other seven principles really cannot come alive and be lived out unless it's done in a multicultural beloved community. But what I want to focus on is some specific wording here. It says, Gene or wholeness. La, 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 la. Implied in that sentence, to me, implied in that sentence is we are not whole. As we journey toward wholeness, because we are not whole. Or another way I would put it is we are broken. Especially in the last two and a half years, if you weren't broken, you're supposed to be broken by now. The world is broken. We have seen its brokenness. We knew it was broken before, and now we really know it's broken. So journeying toward spiritual wholeness, a level of depth that we yearn for, can only be realized in beloved community. That's what, in April of 2018, you affirmed and voted on. And in voting, you have said to the UUA, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to do and become. So the eighth principle becomes that guide. It's that benevolent aspiration that we continue to strive for. It's that thing we have our eyes on the prize. It's the prize, beloved community. It's what we truly, truly want. And that is a journey toward wholeness. So the question then becomes, on this journey, what are you willing to do? How are you willing to participate? Will you participate? And what will your participation look like? So I wanted to finish up this morning with these words, which are in the back of the hymnal as a responsive reading. And I think you'll get to the the point, even though she never says it, this piece by Marge Piercy. And if you've got a hymnal at home, it's number 567. And I'll read the unitalicized, if you'll read the bold and italicized. I want to be with people who submerge in the task. Who go and... Who stand in the line in a hall in their place. The work of the world is common as mud, botched, it smears the hands and crumbles to dust. The living work of doing well has been shaped the Greek amphoras for wine or oil, Hopi vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know they were made to be used. So what do you want history to do to you? We so often think of history as a passive thing to read, but we each carry our history with us, our frames of reference, our identities, our aspirations. What do you want your history to do? What do we, as UUCAers, want our history to do to us? Let us emerge ourselves in the journey toward wholeness in becoming and a beloved community. Thank you. Amen. No,